All right, the first thing we're going to do is chuck onto this end of the part. Now, um, so happens just coincidentally that this diameter, the OD of this thread, is the same as the diameter on the end of this part on this end. So I could use the same exact chuck jaws that I was using. So now, because there's an alignment issue between this end of the part and this end in the dimensions on the drawing, we have to be careful that we get our C-axis zero set up in such a way that our program is aligned to here. And I've, I've chosen to, to indicate on this um, hole that I drilled in the first operation to get my uh, rotational zero on the, on the C-axis here. So I'm going to put that facing roughly up vertical. I'm going to chuck on to things here. And make sure it's tight. Oh, by the way, um, in a lot of videos on uh, YouTube, you see people tightening the chuck on all three of these. Uh, these are actually bevel gears inside the chuck that rotate the um, scroll in here to close, you know, open and close the jaws. Now, uh, if your chuck's tight inside, it doesn't matter. You don't need to tighten all three of these. If, if the scroll is, is, um, has play in, the, in its bore inside the chuck's body here, every time you tighten on a different uh, screw here, you know, gear here, it'll shift that scroll around. And so it'll actually uh, throw your... Um, chuck off center now if you have a chuck like that 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 uh has has play in the scroll what you can actually do is is uh as you indicate your part in you can actually tap on the jaws on the tops of the jaws here and uh get it to run true because no matter what you do if you if you start to tighten the you know if you put your uh if you put your chuck key in here and you tighten it then you tighten here those bevel gears are going to be shifting that scroll around in the chuck. That's what happens when you do that. And it's just going to keep continually throwing your part off center. No matter what you do, you open and close the chuck or whatever. But on these, on the old chucks, what I used to do is tap, tap on the jaws. On the three jaw chuck. On a four jaw, of course, like this over here, you, you just adjust the jaws. But And you can actually tap the, the jaws around a little bit. You know, if the if the chuck's running off out of you know about a couple of two or three thousandths, and it's and it's an old chuck, oftentimes that'll work. But you just tap on the OD of the jaws. Now, um, if it's not a set true chuck, now if it's a set true like this one is, um, then then uh, you can just I don't know what I'm doing here. You don't pay attention. You can. Just um, adjust these screws, of course. We're just going to check the run out up here close to the chuck. Make sure I'm not hitting my uh, jaws on the dial indicator. Actually, let me see. I, I don't know how tight this. Uh, I don't know how tight this chuck is, but let me see if I can even demonstrate this a little bit. See how that dial indicator moves when I tap on that jaw? And see, this is one way you can adjust the chuck if you don't have a set true chuck. Every chuck has to have a certain, see that, let me, let me zero the indicator right here on, uh, in fact, let me get closer in here so you can kind of see this and I'll demonstrate it if I can. You see, I've got the indicator zeroed. Let me get straight on it so you can see it better. Get, get, up the, get the glare off of there. Okay, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this on the video that clear, but the indicator's right on zero here. I'm just going to do this on do this on purpose. Well, first let me zero it. Excuse me, I'm in the wrong axis. Okay, I'm going to put it on the C axis. I'm going to rotate around. 
Now see, it's just a hair off, and I if I tap it, this chuck's pretty tight, but you can see I can actually move the indicator, or the jaw. Now see, we're even further off here. I'm just, I'm intentionally just kind of throwing this off a little bit so you can see it. Now it's, it's running pretty true. See, so when I first started, that was running out. In fact, let me just knock it way, way off. See how I can move it just by tapping on the jaw? And I can, I can bring it back. Here, this one's the furthest off. Kind of hard for me to see the indicator accurately because I'm looking around the camera at the moment. So I've got the camera right in front of it. See, even though I'm not adjusting the set true, you can, you can move. You can move the um, jaws that moves the scroll in the chuck. Now this this is this chuck is held so solid way over here. On an arbor like this, I could be moving the whole thing, hitting it that hard. But with these dovetail jaws that I have over here, well, you really can't. You see, you see those dovetail jaws. This thing doesn't move at all in this four jaw chuck. So no matter how hard I hit it it really wouldn't move it. I'm not really hitting it that hard, but... Anyway, if you have a chuck that, 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 um... Like I say, doesn't have any of this set true type of method on these, you know, screws here, you can actually adjust it this way, very, very small amount, depending on how much play is in the, in the scroll inside the chuck. Okay, we've got that running true enough that way. Now we're going to go up here. I'll move this over a little bit. And we're going to check our run out here. I'm going to bring the indicator back to zero. That's a different diameter than up here. This is a little bit larger. The thread OD is the same as this. So I could use the chuck jaws are bored for this thread diameter back here. I'm not touching the front of the jaws here, but the milling and stuff we're going to do out here on the end of the part is so light right here that this isn't critical. This is enough to hold the part back here just with this amount. So let's check the run out here. And that's running pretty darn good there. I'm, I think I'm not even going to mess with that. That's that's within a half a thousand. I'm trying to get the the whole general part to be running true in the chuck here, because these dimensions on the end of the part are in relation to this diameter or this OD here, which is data may on the print. And then we have some rotary um, alignments for the key thing that's getting milled in the end of the part here. So what I'm going to do. I'm going to set my, um, first I'm going to check the X and Y zero just for the heck of it. It usually isn't off very much. Now this is kind of a little bit tricky to do. I'm going to, I'm going to run this over to a, what's going to ultimately be close to my C zero position with this thing. I'm going to mark a, um, Mark this hole right here. There's a hole in the end of the part. You can't see it right now. I'm going to change the indicator. To this, um, this interrupted indicator I use in this arm. Like I said in the previous video, I've tested this, this, um, if you could see it. I've tested this indi indicator combinations and I know that it, um, I know that it runs good up and down. Gravity doesn't affect it too much. Maybe a tenth of a thousandth or so. I've got to unclamp the spindle so it can rotate. I'm going to move this down. I'm 
I'm going to manually jog the machine to X and Y zero. All right. Now, what I'm going to do here is indicate on the top of this thread. And if I rotate the part with the indicator, I can stay on the crest. I can stay on the crest of that thread. So let me move the, the camera over. All right, I put a mark over here on the part so that I can kind of visually see where I'm at. I'm going to jog this thing up as close as I can without having interference problems here so that my arm is not extended any further than necessary. I want to make sure I'm kind of on the center of that crest. Now this is an Acme thread so I can do this. On a V-thread this would be, it wouldn't be impossible but it would be very difficult. So now I'm going to zero the indicator there. And then we're going to rotate around. Now see, if I, if I rotate the chuck, the, the indicator a certain amount here, see it doesn't fall off the thread until I get pretty far away. I can rotate. So if I'm close to that mark I put on the part there, it'll be good. So I'll rotate around. Trying to see my zero point. Now, the machine is, is cold and it's just, I just barely turned it on. And so, so these things vary a little bit. In an ideal world, this should be dead on, but it, it varies a little bit. It, not enough to really matter. I'm just being ultra picky here, really. Let's see. Yeah, because there's only like seven ten thousandths. Let me rotate the part on the um, X. And this could just be because the machine's cold. I mean, it was off for a day um, overnight too and everything. And if I really wanted to be real particular, I could check this before I did any real critical stuff after the machine warms up. But it's only off it's off less than a thousand it's seven ten thousandths y was pretty good just the way it was I'm not gonna mess I'm not gonna mess with that so let me orient the spindle clamp the spindle um, the reason I do that is I can't take the tool out of this spindle on this machine without doing that put the hammer in here we're going to zero this on the end of the part get you a better look of this because the parts could vary in length a little bit I just want to make sure There's nothing really super critical on the depths here as far as the dimensions on the depth of these features on the end, but I do have some engraving on the end here and that is kind of sensitive to depth. Although um, in this case the lathe guy did pretty good. It's only like four ten thousandths difference in length between this part and the last one I did. So now I'm going to change back to that other indicator. And we're going to come up here in the vertical direction on Y0 and indicate this, uh, well, if you could see what I'm talking about. I'm going to come back to the vertical direction with the new indicator. So back to this setup, and we're going to indicate this um, hole I talked about earlier for, for our um, C0. Now, let's set this roughly so the indicator is in the center, more or less. 
Now I know this hole from the end of the part is two point. I gotta look at my number two point six six one from the end of the part here. So I've set my zero already. Now this could vary a little bit because of the length of the parts, but I'm gonna come over to the zero or to my two point to my two point six six one. I gotta unclamp the spindle so I can rotate it. I'm gonna jog down here to where my indicator is close to the it's close to the part here and, and I'm gonna kind of rough adjust this around about the edge of that hole. And I'm gonna look at things here. Rotate around. See if I'm kind of close to being centered. Looks doesn't look too bad. So I'm I'm gonna put this in the in the hole. And get it set so maybe you could see it a little bit. See the rotation is off, so I'm gonna coarsely jog that away just to get sort of close. I'm going to readjust re my indicator. Zero it out. Make sure these X direction is sort of close to being right. I'm going to rotate my C. To zero thereabouts. I don't well you can't probably can't see that because maybe this would be a better angle. What I'm mostly interested here is getting the C axis I'm gonna adjust things until I get zero all the way around or pretty darn close. Alright. That looks pretty good right there. So I didn't move my Y axis, which is this, which is uh, this direction, off of zero. And I let that stay on zero, and then I only rotated the C, and I adjusted Z a little bit to get centered on the hole. And now I can set my uh, C zero on my fixture offset. Now my uh, my C is off a little bit from the previous part, so I'm going to um, go over here to work offset, just like that. I'm going to run the cursor down. There's going to be a cursor here down to the, the C axis. I'm going to say teach, and over here I'm going to enter a zero, push input down here, and you should see that number change a little bit. If we go back to the position display, it's not on zero until I hit reset. And now our C is zeroed for G54. Indicator out of the way. Orient the spindle because I have to do that to get, it out, get the tool out. And it has to be in the horizontal direction too, or, or parallel to the turning spindle if you will. This would be B0 on this machine. There must be um, safety interlocks or something. I guess they feel it's safer to take the tool out of the spindle or to release it when it's sitting horizontal like this. And this is actually the B-axis tool change position as well on this machine, although it orients the spindle slightly different for the arm, the, tools, the tool changer arm than this, but this machine has a um, what they call a flex tool option, which means it can orient and clamp this spindle 
in uh, 15 degree increments, I believe it is. So, and that's um, and that's important for uh, turning tools mostly, unless you're doing some kind of shaping operation with a milling tool or you know a broaching or shaping operation. Just for turning tools, you can orient the spindle in every 15 degrees and clamp it. Now there's a um, there's a coupling. This is why this spindle is so big in diameter down at the end of this machine here, because uh, there's a um, coupling inside here right behind this plate that's a, it's kind of like a hydraulic cylinder and it has gear teeth and it and as the spindle rotates and orients it clamps it back and then they they um release power i think to the spindle motor so it doesn't sit there fighting against this coupling continuously and it um so it's clamped right behind here on the spindle itself so this so the turning tools aren't setting on the bearings of the spindle if you will right behind this this steel plate there's a coupling about this big in diameter which is why this is that size and it clamps hydraulically there's a another piston thing that clamps against it in such a way that it doesn't shift the spindle at all in the z direction this way against the bearings or something it's a pretty uh, clever mechanism in here that, that the way it clamps so it doesn't shift the spindle at all and it holds it so that the force of turning is not against the bearings of the milling spindle if you will the the bearings are right behind all of this and the spindle and the motor are all integral this is this is a direct drive 50 horsepower motor that is the spindle of the milling spindle and so that's the way it can support a tool and if you have a say a long boring bar that's sticking way out here you know you wouldn't want that all this force against the bearings of the spindle and this this distributes it against this uh, coupling in front of the spindle so that's the reason that on these type of machines usually most manufacturers work this way that they have some kind of a a coupling device right in the front of the spindle here that distributes the load of the turning tools and and like I said this machine can it can orient and clamp this spindle every 15 degrees for that purpose of the turning tools if you have turning tools that are facing this way or that way or, or they make some that have these little mini turret like things on the end that have tools all the way around them and and uh, you can do all that stuff if you have this not all of these integrexes have that option that's an option you have to have on the machine otherwise it would just in, it would just clamp it um, I think every 90 degrees in that case is a standard spindle but if you have the flex tool option it can clamp it every 15 degrees So now we're ready to uh, run the program. This is a very simple program. We're just milling a key and doing a, a couple of holes and uh, some engraving on the end of the part to finish the end of this part. But like I said, it all has to be in alignment, uh, in a rotating alignment to the other end over here. Before we get to the machining of the part, I want to talk a little bit about gun drilling. Because I had quite a few questions in the previous video about this, and I thought I'd try to answer some of them. But first, we got to kind of discuss what normally, what is normally done when you're gun drilling. Now, I'm using the gun drills in sort of a, a little bit of a um, different way or, or unorthodox way compared to the way a gun drill is normally used in a in a conventional gun drilling machine they have something like this they have a well you got your part so you're going to drill a hole through the part here somewhere like this and on a, on a regular gun drilling machine they have some kind of fixturing to hold this part it could be a three jaw chuck it could be V blocks it could be whatever and they have this box I'll just draw it like this here that has a bushing in it that is the um, 
ID is the size of your gun drill, uh, usually a hardened steel bushing like this. And this box is, it's either open out the bottom or it has some kind of chute that comes out here where the shavings come out. So the gun drill is going to go through here and drill and the shavings and coolant are going to be caught in this box and then they're going to um, fall down this way into the chip pan or something, you know, coolant tank, chip pan or whatever. And right here they have a little, um, it's usually a little plastic seal that seals on the shank of the gun drill. So it has, it has something in it that, that fits in the flute and around the gun drill, but it can rotate, generally rotates with the drill. And so the drill goes through that seal here and, and, um, and it comes back out here to the spindle of the machine, wherever that is right here okay and and this and this and the spindle rides on ways so it can move back and forth and feed the drill this part of the thing doesn't need to move at all um, although there are some that are like legs and this rotates as well as the drill so they're both rotating that's uh, um, the the kind of gun drilling they drill like gun barrels of long gun barrels they rotate both parts at once to get the best concentricity of the hole and if this drill is long enough they can have multiple steady rests in here that that um ride on a separate set of ways kind of like the the center on, a, on an engine lathe the the tailstock center has inner ways and then this thing rides on outer ways and they can collapse as the drill goes in supporting the drill and this is a this is a conventional gun drilling machine and they typically use, um, this is the bed of the machine down here, they typically use oil as a coolant on a, on a real gun drill machine. Because the tip of the drill isn't, isn't really round. I, I picked this larger drill, so maybe you could see this on the video. And it kind of has some wear here, so it kind of accentuates the, the lands on the drill. I don't know if you can see that or not. You see that kind of edge here? So this is clearance on the back of the drill, or the back top of the drill, if you will. And then this is the, the land, and it goes about up to here. I don't know if you can see that or not. Can you see the, the light, the way it reflects? And there's another clearance area, and then it comes up to the, the relief angles of the edge of the drill here. Although it doesn't really cut along this edge, or if it does, it cuts very little, if anything. The drill has a, the tip of the drill. Most gun drills are single flute, although some can have two flutes on each side. I've never used one like that. I've always used these single flute ones. And they grind, you grind this tip, is a, a quarter, or the standard grind, I should say. There's many different kinds of grinds depending on what you want to do. But this tip is a quarter of the drill's diameter over. It's typically for a standard grind. And um, the relief angles, are, there's a primary relief angle and secondary on this. And there's really no, just one relief on this center section. And then a, a relief right in the center of the drill here. And then this relief on this side is only for the purpose of, of a coolant comes out the, you can see the coolant holes in this drill, and it comes out and travels around and it, and it shoves the shavings down the shank or the flute of the drill here. So this is, this is a standard, typical grind. This, I think I may have re-ground this, this drill before, but you can kind of see it maybe. I don't know if this camera is good enough to show you that. But I had a lot of questions on this and, and um, how, you know, what are the feeds and speeds and various things like that. And a gun drilling process is a slow process, I would call it, compared to, say, a twist drill. It, it takes more time, but it's, in, in my opinion, it's more reliable when you're drilling maybe 20 diameters and deeper type holes it's uh, more reliable than a twist drill type of th situation. At least for me, it's been that way. And uh, 
you pretty much just get the feed and speed right and then you just drill and you don't have any trouble. Now on this particular parts, let me get my calculator. On this, on this part that I just am doing in this video series, there's um, there's eight holes, eight, and they're eight inches deep all the way through the part. So that's 64 inches. On on these are point two one or two oh three holes. So 64 inches of those, and then there's two holes that were 5.3 times two. 10.6, so 10.6 inches, and they're 0.187 diameter, 5, 3 sixteenths, and then there was one hole that was 0.156, and it was 5.3 inches, so plus 64 plus 5.3, so the total is 79 0.9 inches of hole length in this in this little part in all the holes. There's eight of these, eight, two, and one quantities. Now in all of that drilling, I did I drilled times nine parts, the 719 inches of hole length, 0.1, um, and I didn't have any trouble with the drills. I did. I did bust one little one of the three sixteenths drills. This is it here. I, I broke the tip off of it, but it was my fault because when you're um, when you're drilling with these drills, you're using high pressure coolant usually, and uh, this they they all come with a certain shanks. Like these smaller ones come with a three quarter inch shank up to about this size, and then they start getting a uh, one inch shank and an inch and a quarter shank as they get bigger. But uh, if you calculate the area of a three-quarter inch shank with 1,500 psi against it, it's um, it's pushing with five, six hundred pounds of force. The minute that coolant comes on, to shove this thing out of the the holder, and I I don't think I had the screw on here correctly on this particular drill. And when the coolant came on, it shoved it forward. Oh, I, I don't know about three sixteenths of an inch or so, quarter of an inch in the holder, and it just crammed the tip in there and it broke the tip off the drill. It was my fault. Otherwise, I wouldn't have broke a single drill on this whole job. So, 719 inches a hole, and uh, I was thinking about the economics of this. Now, it takes longer. Now, the, the drill, generally speaking, you're going to not feed a gun drill more than a thousandth of an inch per revolution, and usually less. In fact, these this drill I was feeding at the at I think I was feeding more or less all these drills at four ten thousandths of an inch per revolution which at the at the RPM I was running each one of them came out to about one inch per minute um, of, of feed more or less that it, it varied just a little bit but that's about the feed because these drills aren't too much difference in diameter um, can't remember I think I was running this this one at 2500 RPM and this one at 3,000 and 3,500 RPM on the smaller one. And I was feeding them all at one inch per minute feed rate. So, so the feed rate on these smaller ones is a little bit slower even than this. But one inch per minute feed rate. So it takes roughly, I was using two different tools as you saw in the previous video. Drilled halfway with one and halfway with another. But let's just, let's just say it com combines to it takes eight in, eight minutes to drill one hole through eight inches, right at one inch per minute. So that so that would be uh, um, eight times eight is 64 minutes to drill those eight holes, and then you can calculate these other ones. But I was I was thinking about this and comparing it. Now I, I priced out a um, in order to drill this length with a twist drill. You got to have a 40 diameter twist drill, 40 diameter drill depth, that, you know, plus the shank and everything. And uh, and so I thought, well, is this economical or not? You know, what what if you did use a twist drill and if you could drill it faster? And so the economics of this is is such that I'm not sure it. Even though you could drill faster with this drill, the drill is so much more expensive. I priced out one drill just to see, and it was a a Guring. 
40 times diameter 203 thousandths drill and that's $519 for that one drill. Now one of these, these uh, gun drills that I was using is $72 or, and the other one's $519 for a twist drill. Now you're obviously not going to just buy one twist drill to do these parts because you got this many holes to do. You're probably going to buy two or three of them just to be safe because if you break one or do something you know you're going to have extras to continue the job so if you bought three of these drills you're already looking at fifteen hundred dollars fifteen hundred and sixty dollars just to just to buy the tooling and uh, and in reality I didn't really break one single one of these drills I did buy extra drills but I could have got by with just maybe two or three of each so you can see the the savings in the tooling right there now if you could drill twice as fast with a twist drill I'm not sure you would make up the savings in tooling between the twist drill and the and the um, gun drill although you would do it faster but even doing it faster you save a certain amount in labor or shop rate if you want to call it that and and you're, you're really not um, necessarily saving money by doing it faster with a twist drill even though it takes you a little more time with the gun drill your your cost of your tooling is so expensive with a twist drill like this that it really uh, isn't worth it and if you break one of those twist drills in a part you can't get it out I mean or you're, you're gonna have a lot of difficulty getting it out particularly if you're almost all the way through so this is part of the reason I don't use twist and I, and I could even sharpen the twist drill on my CNC tool and cutter grinder properly but on the gun drill, when it, when it broke this one off, of course it was just barely in the hole, but I've done, I've broken them off deeper in, and you take the shank of the old drill and you put it in there and you, you kind of grab it and twist it around and, and you can, you can uh, kind of shatter the, the carbide tip up enough to blow it out with air and, and usually get going again with another drill. And so you broke a, you know, a 70 or $80 drill and it takes you, you know probably about 15 or 20 minutes to get the broken drill out of there completely and then you can continue on but if you if you break a $500 drill and then you can't get it out of the part so you scrap the part and the drill and everything you know you can see you're taking a lot higher risk here for a little bit extra speed not that much extra speed but because I don't think you're going to be feeding this 40 times drill at, at any you know like three or four times faster than these gun drills. You're probably going to feed it at two, maybe three inches per minute if, if you uh, got it going just right. In titanium, uh, I don't know. So that's sort of the economics behind this. It, it's, um, oh, to answer the questions I got, what were the feeds and speeds? I, I kind of answered them already. I, I fed it four ten thousandths of an inch per revolution with the 203 drills at one inch per minute and then on these I fed at one inch per minute with um, I think it's 2500 rpm and 3000 rpm and this was 2500 rpm so they were all about the same you can't feed a gun drill too fast if you do there it starts to wad the shavings up in here and the coolant won't blow them out the out the flute if you get too carried away with that so you gotta feed it slow but it holds really good size it leaves a very nice finish on the bore compared to a twist drill as well. So I don't know if that answers people's questions too much, but there was a few questions about feeds and speeds and how you get a broken drill out. You, you basically, if the tip, the tip will break off, it'll break at the silver solder joint just like this one did. And you, uh, you cram this old shank in there and you twist it around and maybe tap on it some with the hammer and twist it and, and blow the air up in there and you can break the tip because the tip is pretty fragile even on a big one like this with these holes that run through it and everything you, and it generally cracks it when it breaks it it splits it down the middle too so you can get it out pretty easily I've never in all the years I've been using these not been able to get a broken gun drill out of a hole but that's not been true with a twist drill if I try to use these kinds of twi twist drills so those are my reasons for mostly for using gun drills. The cost of the drill is, is more economical. I can resharpen it. It probably only takes five minutes to resharpen one of these drills. 
and I do have a video on that that I go into that in detail. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember the name of the video, but I do have one in, in my videos that I show that in, in, in real detail on how I sharpen the gun drills when I do it. So I thought I'd just answer a few of those questions, and now we can go on with the machine work on this part. Okay, here's the machining operation. First tool is a um, 3 16 end mill, just to mill this key slot in here on both sides. Um, different than the first operation on the other side, I positioned the part horizontally so I didn't have to rotate it in the middle of milling both sides of this. Really should have done that on the first side, but I didn't do it that way. So that's the 3 16 end mill. And that's an eighth inch or 0.125 deep and 312 thousandths wide key slot. So I'm just depth miking it there. You saw that I filed the, that file I'm using is a very fine like jeweler's file just to knock the burrs off before I measure the depth. Otherwise you'd have the error of the burrs in your depth measurement. A spot drill for a, the 632 hole and then the tap drill for the 632 thread. A lot of coolant here, it's kind of hard to see, but... And then uh, the 632 thread mill. Now fortunately I was able to get this to work pretty good. I, I milled the threads and then I did a bunch of spring passes on this tool. Uh, I think five actual spring passes and that seems to be working so there's going to be no hand tapping involved here. I was able to get the threads to gauge straight from the thread mill which is a little bit difficult in this 632 thread in titanium. I've had trouble with this in the past and I have to hand tap these holes like this but I got this to work with all those spring passes. I was able to get it to gauge as you can see here. So that's nice not to have to do any hand tapping. The thread is like 411 thousandths deep, 632 thread, kind of a deep thread for a 632. And here's a spot drill just to uh, spot for two other holes. One hole, the drill after this is just a 218 thousandths hole. I think it's 880 thousandths deep. And then the other hole has a kind of a counter bore. And then a, a 166 hole, but it has plus or minus two on the 166 hole. So this is just roughing it out with a 0.159 drill, I believe. And then I milled a counter bore, 280 thousandths counter bore, quarter inch deep. see that I'm checking the, the depth and the diameter here. It's not, it's like plus or minus 10 on both these dimensions, so it's nothing critical. And then uh, I bored this hole with the boring head just to be safe. Probably could have reamed it, but they were calling for a, a maximum radius at the bottom of the, of the hole, so I decided to bore it. And here I, I took two passes at boring it, but later I just I just ran the tool, and it worked all right on later parts. And I didn't back off the head at all to get it to size. And here's just the engraving of the numbers. There's a um, six numbers and one letter on the end of this part for some reason. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing, but calls it out for it on the drawing. So I'm using a 1 32nd inch uh, like die sinking ball end mill, which just has a very short cut length here and taking a little, like a thousandth of an inch at a time. The drawing specifies 20 thousandths of an inch depth for this engraving, so have to go down that deep like like I did on the side 
sides of the part in the previous video. So that's the very simple operation on this end of the part. It finishes up this uh, part and this series on this part. So thanks for watching.